company of people, we come before your throne. And although this is a weekly gathering, Father God, we want to we want to have an understanding in our hearts that this is a coming together of saints to receive instruction from you, my Father, to move to the next level, to go to a deeper, higher, wider place, to get to understand, to have a greater revelation, to shift, to align, to propel, not to stay the same, Father, but to grow, to go deeper, higher, wider, deeper, higher, wider, to find a place within you where we can settle in, Father God, to begin to understand what it means to live and move and have my being in you. Let's understand what it means to be seated in Christ in heavenly places. Let's begin to understand what it means that it's no longer I who love, but Christ that lives in me. Let's understand what it means to live this life in Him and through Him. I ask, Father, that you'll open up our hearts. I pray, Father, that all these religious spirits within this city, Father God, that trenches in the relationship and that takes away from, from the ecclesia will die will die out, Father. We need to rise up. We need to begin to understand who we are. And religion no longer has a place in our life. A rigid order no longer has a place in our lives, Father God. As we grow, as we mature, as we shift, we go to the next place. We go to the next level of relationship, of covenant, of friendship, of the brotherhood, of you being our Father. Father, every covenant in a family shifts and grows as the, the, the order of the people grow older. And I pray, Father, we'll begin to understand that in us, there needs to be a change, consistently changing, never staying the same. We have to live a life of repentance. And we understand that has nothing to do with sin. It has to do with changing the way you think, changing the way you think, changing the way you think. Father, we need a company of people that will constantly begin to change the way we think, to shift in a new way, a new perception, Father. Every time we see more of you, we have to change the way we understand the previous revelation. Every time you open up more to us, we have to shift so we can begin to think out of a new place regarding who you are. <clears throat> I pray, Father, that you open up our hearts. That tonight as we go into a place where we get to understand that we are forerunners, we get to understand that we need to move out of the place where we think everything has to be led step by step. We move, we have to step into a place where we understand the power of desire and how important it is for us to grow and mature to that place where we don't do things out of you ordering us. We don't do things out of being led every step. I know it sounds right. It sounds like it should be like that. But Father, we understand in your heart you want to mature people that will be led by desire, that will be led by what you've placed inside of us. Not by command, but out of friendship, covenant, relationship, intimacy with a true living God that is one with us, that we are one with. I ask tonight you open up our hearts, Father. We love you. We praise you. We come before you in the sweet, precious, incredible name of Yeshua, where we step in to the Yad Hei Vavai As Lashin, and we are surrounded by your presence and your glory and your fire and your fullness to the measure where we become, where we become one with you. I ask tonight, Father, you'll open us up. Shift, shift us into a place with you where we have not been yet, my King. You are majestic. You are beautiful. And Father, we love you, my King. Thank you, Yahweh. Amen. 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 Any of you guys want to switch on one of the lights? I don't know how you feel. You're, you're, you're in the pews. You tell me. You're in the pew. How does you'll be in the pew? It's not a pew, dude. It's not a pure Gustav. <laughs> I, the only reason I'm a preacher is because I fall asleep listening to other preachers. Right. So there's nothing special about me. God just knew if he wanted to grow me, he's going to have to make me a preacher because I can't sit still in church. Right. So don't think for one second I'm the beast needs. <laughs> God had to keep me in church. This is the only way he can do it. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> but I remember when I was in school, I mean, I remember this one specific case of having to do an oral where I broke my bench so that I can get sent to the office <laughs> so that I didn't have to do an oral. So, this is not, it has never been my favorite thing to do. <laughs> but as you grow, you always kind of shifts. So what I want to do tonight is I really want us to get to a place of understanding. You know, we are the forerunners of this generation uh, because we've grown, we've shifted, we, we've gone to a place where our, our mental understanding of theology doesn't block us. Mm. We have to understand the law of first mention. And this is a very powerful law, unfortunately. Whatever you heard first 
is either going to propel you into your next walk or it's going to block you into your next walk. Because whatever you've believed previously has become a reality to you. And if that wasn't the full truth, then the rest of the truth following that is going to be blocked by a theological understanding you have of the Word. Wow. Right. Now, I've said this to you guys before. It's very important to understand if we've only had, over the last, say, 1,500 years, they say the Bible is about 1,600 years old. It says it took about 1,600 years to write. It's 66 books, 40 different authors. And so we understand we have made this book the only portion of the Word of God, even though the Word of God within the Bible talks about the Word of God before the Word of God was even written, Correct. but yet we still think the Word of God is that which is written. We are now beginning to understand, while well, the written is only a portion of the truth. So we have two other dimensions, because if Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life, we understand that He is that full measure of the Word. And if we only have the Logos, we forget that there is Rhema, and there is that which is living. And if we break those up into smaller portions, we begin to understand that that which is written, as important as what it is, is what the Bible talks about in Ephesians being the bout. So you have to understand something here. Yeah, for me personally, and nowadays, um, men's genes are stretchy. <laughs> Matter of fact, I thank God for modern day stretchy genes. Yeah. Because I cannot climb into jeans that's not stretchy. I mean, let me tell you that. If you need to get into the car and your jeans are not stretchy, you're not getting into the car. There's a whole nother way of getting into a car if your jeans is not stretchy. <laughs> I don't know who thought of stretchy jeans, but woohoo, dude, thank you. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> You know, so I, I need to put a belt on because now you've got stretchy jeans, but it's tight around the legs because I've got big legs and it's really big around the waist because I don't have the smallest waist, but I have a smaller waist than what my legs are. Oh, I don't know if that makes sense. And then I've got my calves are huge, and so stretchy jeans is always skinny jeans. I don't know what retard thought of skinny jeans, but you're a fool. <laughs> stretchy skinny jeans makes really no sense. It should be stretchy bell bottoms or bigger jeans. But but nowadays it's stretchy. Anyway, in my case, I have to wear a belt. If I don't wear a belt, although it's tight around my legs, it's not going to go anywhere. It's extremely loose around the way. So it really is, it's designed to hold everything together. It's designed to keep you from getting into a position of embarrassment. You know, and it's funny because when you wear clothes, well, what is that barely saying that this is what I wrote and gave you to keep everything together. Mm. So it doesn't mean it's the all in all. And we say, oh, well, the, the sword is the sword is the word. The belt, the belt is, is not the word. No, no, the belt is a portion of the word and the sword is a portion of the word. Mm. But then there's another dimension within this that we have to go into, and I've said this so many times, and I want you to really get it, because we've been so physical, fleshly, that we could only study the physical written word. Wow. Mm. Although we were, we were born again, and we were on fire for the Messiah, and we can shut our kabanda until the cows come home, you know, unfortunately, we never really got to the point where we understand, well, for me to move into all of what Yahweh has for me, I need something that can hold my physical body together, which is the written Word of God. But then we also have other dimensions of the Word that I have to be able to engage. So we have to understand what it means to be born from above. Because I'm not born again, I was never a baby. I'm an ancient being that walked an ancient path before I was sent to my mother's womb. Yes. So when I get born from above, I reactivate the spirit man that's already been in heaven, that's already seen the Father, that's already walked in that realm, that's already understood and have full influence in that dimension. He now has to connect to the soul, which is the world mind emotion uh, of, a, of a person to bring that image back into its original form. Yes. Now, I'm saying this because I'm trying to break it up into portions for you to understand that my soul and my spirit is the same image. So my soul is the image of my spirit. Just like my spirit is the image of Yeshua and my body is the image of my parents. Now we've talked about this before. So the process of me going in is that I need to understand more than just that which is written. I need to engage that which is spoken. And of course that which is spoken goes into Eon Satan. 
That means that my Father in heaven could have said things that was never written down, but because I'm spirit and because that was said out of time and space, I can go into the atmosphere and hear the echo of the revelation spoken into a spirit. And as I go into it, wrapped up in my soul. Now I say this because it's so key for me to divide my soul and my spirit so that my spirit and my soul is no longer bound to each other because I want to remind you how unhealthy the soul tie was. My soul was not meant to be first in charge. Wow. It was not, it's never meant to be the, the being in charge. The spirit's the primary you. So the spirit has to get reactivated because when Adam, when Yahweh said, well, you know, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. So he goes, oh, really? Really? So he takes the fruit, he eats the fruit, and he's like, well, I didn't die. So either God's a liar or Adam died. Something happens. So we understand that I have to get born from above, the reactivation of my spirit. But my spirit is also that source that gives life. Yes. So my spirit couldn't have died because if my spirit died, there was nothing feeding life to my soul and my body. Mm -hmm. So we understand that the spirit is connected to the full measure of Yahweh. But the, the spirit, before I get born from above, doesn't have the full activation of doing what it's supposed to do. So once I get born again, that's where discipleship comes in. That's why your training and equipping is so extremely expen expensive. Uh, yes. Extremely. Yes. <laughs> it, it is expensive. <laughs> extremely important because when you begin to understand the value in your growth, you understand the Father's desire is to get you back to your restored position. Yeah. Which is, is, is much, much more powerful than what we've obviously believed up to this point. Right. Because it's not just, oh, Shane, how bad are you? You know, it's not every Sunday I have to get born again. I told you guys, I literally broke my rededicator. <laughs> I, mean, I think you can only give your life to Jesus 999 million times, and I think I did it almost a billion times. Because every time I went to church, something happened the way he said it, and I thought, yeah, no, damn, I have to get myself to Jesus again. <laughs> I have to get myself to Jesus again. Because he would say stuff like, if, if you are not 100% right with God, you need to come forward. I'm thinking... Uh, yeah, yeah. That's me. I have to go get born again. Yeah. I mean, if I was in church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I've given my life to Jesus five times. I'm a Bible school student. I'm almost walking on water. I mean, I'm prophesying people's mouths out of their brain, I mean, their thoughts out of their brains. It, it's that intense, but I'm giving my life to Jesus every Sunday, like five times. Because it's the way they said it. But we have to understand something, when I really truly get born from above, the activation that takes place is designed to completely change my life, because from that moment I divide soul and spirit. Now, I was only taught to divide soul and spirit like 25 years later. Wow. Hmm. So I got discipled and I got trained 25 years in, 13 years of Bible school, and I never was taught to divide soul and spirit. Yes. Wow. I mean, as a matter of fact, the scripture was there. I read it a million times, but never made any sense to me. It made sense because it's a good scripture, but only when I really began to understand the value and who I am as a spirit and that I shouldn't be bound to my soul because it takes from me. I remind you, I'm born into creation, into sin. I'm not born a sinner, which means I don't come into the world, out of the womb sinning. I'm born into a system that's broken, that has missed the mark. I'm coming out of my mother into creation and everything around me is corrupt. No matter how beautiful the setting is, no matter how beautiful and how powerful the people around you are, no matter how beautiful the hospital is and how clever the doctor is, you're in a position where everything surrounding you right from that moment on is really corrupting you, really taking from you. So even the truth that you're receiving from your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your best friends, your teachers, television, everywhere you go, all the truth that's coming in is small, has small portions of corruption in it that takes from the truth of who you're meant to become. So by the time you get really truly born from above, there's a whole process of change that needs to take place in you to get you to the order that you're supposed to walk in. Are you guys okay? Yes. And of course, in this time, like I said last week, and I really, I really try to get this across, um, it depends on how your father was in your life, that's how God will be in your life. Oh. That's <laughs> now look at your life, look at the way that you uh, look at the father, and then look at how the father was with you. Now don't get upset with me about it. Now my father was an alcoholic, and you're thinking to yourself, what are you trying to say? God's about to smack you. 
No, but my father was, my mom and my dad was like this. I was the only kid in my closet that can go straight up to my mother and say, Mom, I'm going to go drinking. Me and my friends are going to this party. I'm probably going to go to this bar or to this uh, bottle store to buy this alcohol. Um, and we're going to drink and I'll probably be home at about 4 o'clock. This is where I'm going to be all night. And if we go from this house, I'm probably going to go to that house and that house. But I'll be back by 4 o'clock. Okay, son. Okay. Wow. My, my, my friends had to lie like dogs. We came to a pajama party. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember uh, he would be like, I'm going to sleep at Gustav's house. And then Kurt would say to his mom, I I'm going to sleep at um, Leon's house. And we've had this whole, everybody, because uh, mom don't like that guy, the other mom don't like that guy. And so you've got all these different kids sleeping at everyone's different house because everybody wants to go to the party, but they had to lie to their parents. I never, ever had to lie to my parents. I just straight up tell my parents whatever, anything, at any given time, whatever I wanted to say, they will either be upset about it, but in a way that would still encourage me. I don't know, my parents were just different. You know? So, although the way I raise my kids is kind of like that, and I look at my kid, my friends, who have, you know, but what I'm trying to say is your parents and the way you were parented is going to be your view of your father. Now, I say that, and it might not be the same for everybody, but we have to get to a place where we realize the order has a specific foot that it has to pan out. Okay, just because your understanding of parenthood had a certain glitch in it doesn't mean that's how it's supposed to be. Right. For example, a, a father cannot order a child around all the days of the child's life. There has to be a, a place in the child's life where the parents step back and say, now you start making your own choices. Mm. Does that make sense? Right. So what I'm trying to get across tonight is that we have to get to that place in our walk with Yahweh where He has placed all His desires in your heart. Yes. And I say this without it really being a major frustration. It's not because so many does it and we don't even do it because... We think it's uh, wrong. We just It's just because of our, our walk with Yahweh. But we say, God taught me to do this. God taught me to do that. God taught me to do this. God taught me that this is what I have to do. And, and it sounds like a really good thing. I'm being obedient to the Most High God. I'm a servant in His house. But what if you were not a servant? What if He's not meant to be ordering you around? What if you are actually a child in His house and He loves you more than life? What is it if he is the one that cares about you more than anybody, that only wants the best for you, that doesn't want to order you around, that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't want to tell you what to do? At a certain point in your growth, you have to come to the point where you realize, my father no longer tells me what to do. I now know exactly what to do, and that's all I do. Yes. Now, I know we don't always understand that because I hear it in the mature of the mature, according to our understanding of maturity. God told me that this is what I have to do. That sounds good. And up to a certain point in your walk with Yahweh, it is great. You have to be obedient. There's a place in my sons and my children's lives where they better be obedient. Because if they're not, they're going to be in big trouble. But there's also an age where you realize you can't smack a son or a child anymore. You realize, well, even if I take his Wi-Fi away or I take any of his cell phone or his Xbox away, he's still got 20,000 other things to do. There's really no way of punishing him because he's reached an age where he thinks for himself. Yeah. Where I've taught him everything I could possibly put in him and he doesn't love me any less. I might feel a little bit, well, he doesn't listen to me anymore. Well, yeah, because I taught him really well. Wow. Mm. I taught him really well and now he knows how to be life. I don't know how to live life. Right. But a child that's only been mothered that can't do anything for himself. So we have to understand when the church that's only had pastors in leadership Please tell wants me. to come tell us what to do all the time. Yeah. And if you don't do what the pastor tells you to do, you're in rebellion. Yeah. Right? And rebellion is like witchcraft. So who are you worshipping? You Satanist. Wow. <laughs> tell the truth. You know, that's kind of where we are. I'm like, I'm sorry, I just don't want to do everything you tell me to do, okay? That's how it is in life. You know, I mean, have you ever had a best friend? Have you ever had a best friend? I mean, this is the one person where you can look in the eyes and say, hey, you freaking moron. Shut the hell up, man. You were retarded. And there's no offense whatsoever in any way, fashion, or form because you're best friends. I mean, he's like, hey, I go, go. 
get your fat ass off that chair and go get me a beer out the fridge. <laughs> no, do it yourself. What is wrong with you? You know, I'm just I'm trying to get across a covenant relationship and, and a place that we grow out of. There's levels in which Yahweh wants to deal with us. Yes. And you have to get to your place where, where me and my, sit, my son, and we're not quite there yet, he's 17 years old, but we can sit and we can really have adult conversations. And we do have many, many adult conversations, but there's certain adult conversations that I don't want to have with my 17-year-old. Yeah. There's certain adult conversations I'd like to have with a 25-year-old, maybe a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old. There's, there's levels of deep, intimate conversations. Yeah. And I want you to understand this because that's kind of where I want to get to tonight. They're always calling a people that grows into a place where we can be covenant with him, uh, in full covenant with him. And I say this is uh, important because Moses did something on the mountain that I don't see a lot of saints do. Mm. He full on argued with God. Correct. People get upset with me when I tell them I argue with God. Well, I've got a very intimate relationship with him and he makes me angry. Yeah. Well, how can God make you angry? I don't know. He says things that I don't like. Like, stop doing that. But I like it. But I don't like it when you do it. But I don't care right now. I want to do it because that's why I do it. I like it. You can say, well, you know, you're going to hell, brother. Well, he's coming with me there. Because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to get across something that's really important to the Father. It's you having the desire of His heart in you. Mm. And it's not something that just happens overnight because I've read my Bible three times today. It's a process. It's an aggression that grows in you. It's a passion that opens up inside of you. Yes. Because desire is the key culture of heaven. Mm. Psalms talk about this. It says, He will, put, he will give us uh, the desires of our hearts. Now, let me tell you, there's a point in your life that if he gives you the desires of your heart, you will die. Yeah, that's right. For real. I mean, there's some desires in my heart. If he gives it to me right now, I will kill somebody. <laughs> what do you think, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not today. Maybe not tonight. <laughs> but but that's because I'm not ready. There's certain things that that uh, he will not put in my heart because certain of some of the desires that's there is not from him. Right. But there's other desires that he, over the years of me growing, going deeper and deeper in covenant relationship with this incredible phenomenal God that he's placed inside of me. And so I desire certain things that goes above him telling me what to do. Mm. Not because I'm in rebellion, because he doesn't want to walk around telling everybody what to do. He's not that manager. He's not that a CEO. He's not that owner. He's not that dad. Right. Mm. You guys okay? Yeah, that's yeah. good. I hear this all the time. Parents, bitching and moaning. Can I say bitching and moaning? You yeah. can. You can say it. Well, I did say it, so I guess I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, the Bible talks about this intensely. Now, it, it's talking about the wife being like a dripping tap. Oh. But that, excuse me, there's men like dripping taps and there's kids like dripping taps. My one son is very talented. Dad, 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 dad. dad. What? Dad, dad. What? And he's like, no, I, I can't remember. I said, well, yes, because you say dad a hundred times. <laughs> so I'm saying dad, you don't want to talk to me. Just talk to me. <laughs> he got it, okay. Yeah. He has put eternity in our hearts so we have an element of right desire in us. You know, there's certain things you're going to desire and you realize in your heart, in, in yourself immediately whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, a while ago, I was asked by a friend of mine to go speak to a lady. So I'm getting to her house. She's 73 years old. She looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I don't know how to explain this to anybody, but she's 73 years old. She's got, uh, looks a little bit like Medusa. Ooh. Dreadlocks, neon white lady, yeah. and we just talk. But she, I'm not talking. She's doing all the talking. Very talented. Flappy lips. <laughs> <laughs> about four, about three hours in, she gets up, says, "Excuse me for a second, Goes to the kitchen, takes this weird little pipe, glowy thingy out, 
and start smoking meth. Oh. And she's like, do you want some? I'm like, what the hell is that? She's like, it's meth. I'm like, hell no. Oh, well, I want meth. First of all, I'll die. Yeah. I'm, I'm asthmatic. I can't inhale anything. But that's not a desire. Drugs is not a desire. Right. And I've had those desires before, but he replaced them with other desires. Yes. Woo. And I, I can remember a day where I couldn't put a cigarette down and not want another one. You know, there had to be a, a time of growth. Things change through your life because you grow, you go deeper, you go higher, you Absolutely. go more aggressive into the things of Yahweh. So your desires change. You know, things I wanted 10 years ago, I don't want anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, things I wanted five years ago, I don't particularly want anymore because Yahweh is opening up new uh, levels of revelation and understanding for me to engage. So I want you to understand that's what he's doing right now. We don't live out of duty, guilt, performance, but operate in our calling where desire is the strongest. Opening and cleansing, and cleansing gateways is by desire. What it's basically saying is, if you're not doing something because you want to, then what's the point of you doing it? Exactly. Because if I say, I command you to do this. Because when you read the Ten Commandments, it's a little bit scary. And then you go to the New Testament, and the commandments has changed from the Ten to Three. So now we've got three commandments. And, and what is a commandment? I mean, isn't your natural, quickly, the average guy listening to a preacher talk, three commandments, so my instant reaction is, someone's commanding me to do something. Right? Am I wrong? Am I, am I right? right yeah. So when he's giving me those three commandments, love the Lord your God Almighty. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, just don't crush me. I mean, I, I love you. I love you. <laughs> and then he goes, and love your neighbor. I, I can love my neighbor as you love yourselves. Okay, well, that could change a little bit. <laughs> <coughs> now it's commandment. I, it sounds very aggressive. But then we look at the Hebrew culture and it breaks everything up for us. Mm. Because the first time he gave commandments, we talked about this before, was on the Mount, Mount Sinai, right? And um, it was Ten Commandments. And we understand in the Hebrew culture, it actually wasn't commandments at all. It was a ketubah. It was a marriage contract. Whoa. So he said, well, this is what I want out of a covenant with you. Now, I've said this as, as well many wow. times. I understand the covenant not that he wants to marry you. The covenant is I want you... To be as intimate and as close to me as a husband and a wife can be to each other. Wow. Don't want to marry you. You are not the bride. Okay, Jesus is not your groom. He's not going to be your husband. Don't get excited, ladies. Because y'all are the only ones who are getting excited for this. Sure is. The boys ain't getting excited. Not. No. Okay. No, no offense, Jesus. Sure you look good. But no. I cannot fathom loving, marrying another man. <laughs> and, and you know if we just listen and pay attention to what was really said no one would believe this but for some reason everybody believes that we are the bride everyone, literally everyone. And how crazy first of all a bride doesn't have any inheritance she's not married yet there's no intimacy it's on the day of her wedding hello but the body has no separation. None. 100% one. There's a level of unity, a level of covenant in a body that I can't even express or explain to you. The way it functions is supernatural and amazing. The oneness of the head and the body functioning together is a supernatural act. It sure is. <coughs> and that's when the pure desire of the Father comes in. When I realize I'm not the bride, but I'm the body and here's the head. How are you guys do, doing? Good. Good. Good stuff now. Mm -hmm. Come on. One of the main ways you know you have daily mandates is through desire. Yes. Our father is a gentleman and never forces his will. So he waits for us. 
You know, I remember driving in the vehicle with my son and he makes a statement to me. He says, Dad, my older son, he says, Dad, are we Christians? I'm like, yes, son, of course we're Christians. It's like, why is Jesus lying? <laughs> like, um, look out for those uh, lightning bolts, son. What you talking about? <laughs> you know, he's like, well, yeah, he said he'll be back soon. It's been like 2,000 years. Uh, and I thought, soon? What, what's how's that soon? And I, and I wanted to, I was very clear with him. I said, well, you can only come back when we are ready. Yeah. So we're not ready. Right. That's why he said, well, I don't know. Well, nobody knows. When's the church going to be ready? For real. Exactly. Because they have to do it. They have to wake up. You and me, we have to wake up. We have to get the desire, the unction in our function to go do what's supposed to get done. Exactly. But we only have a portion of the truth. We only have a portion of the Word of God because we are so fleshly and we are so bound to the soul that's corrupted in sin that we can't understand what the freedom of the Spirit means and the freedom of that dimensional gate that opens up so that I can go into the other two portions of the truth so that I can receive the full measure of what the Word of God really is. Yes. Because when I engage the living, I sit face to face within the kingdom of heaven with my Father. In the yard, hey, love, hey. In that fullness of the tectogram where I sit in my Father's full presence. Ooh. I enter in there as the ship when I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places. Yes. That's a whole other frequency that begins to vibrate over me. Yes. It puts desires in me. It puts cravings and, and an unction in me to do things that I never wanted to do. It also makes me realize that I'm not as weak and pathetic as what they're telling me I am. Right. For real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's it. That's it. The, the, the very logic of our faith is, yes, I know. I can't do anything without Christ. I understand that. But I'm not going to walk around telling everybody the whole time I'm in Christ, I'm in Christ, I'm in Christ, I'm in Christ. I know where I am and I function out of that place. Exactly. Hmm. We have made the name of Jesus a lucky charm. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem because that's not what he meant. Right. And I say this because we pray in the name of Jesus. So we truly believe and that's why we've had such great... Great uh, uh, um, miracles because we believe it so much. But we believe that if we pray something and we add in the name of Jesus, that that's why it's get answered. But that's not what Jesus, if you listen to the Greek mindset, that's what you're going to believe. But when Yeshua spoke to his disciples on this subject, they didn't think like we do. They understood exactly what he was saying. Because their understanding of praying in the name is not like what we understand to do. Because our understanding is praying in the name of Jesus, it's blah, 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 in the name of Jesus, amen. But they understand the power of the function of the name and the idea of being in the name. Because in the Hebrew culture, you go into the name of Yahweh. That's why they breathe their breath into the yacht. Yah. They sing, they breathe their entire breath into the yacht. Then they turn, because that could have been the south. Then they turn to the, the east. And they, I don't know if that's the East, but then they do the same. Yeah, hey, and they blow the entire breath out. And they do the same with all four of the letters. Yes. And that literally creates a position for the, the priest to step into to be in a full measure of his presence. So they understand being in the name is you being positioned in the framework of all of who Yahweh is in the moment that you pray. Yes. Yes. That's different then praying in the name. Because when I'm seated in that realm, when I'm seated in that position, and I'm looking around, and all I see is life, the Zoe life. I see the tree of life. I see the river of life. I see the angelic. I don't see nobody going, Oh my God, my back is sore this morning. Shit. I don't know what to do anymore. Matter of fact, you don't see none of that. <laughs> It's a different dimension. It's almost like Yahweh says, well, when you come out of that realm, yes. then you understand what this realm is supposed to look like. Yes. That's where you get your desire. That's how you bring the legislative power into the day so that we can create the things that needs to be set into position here in creation. You know, I said this before. I get restored so creation can get restored. 
And I don't get restored so God can um, restore creation. I get restored through God so that I, the, the one with dominion over creation, can restore creation. Yes. The creation didn't scream and cry out unto God. Cried out unto the sons of man. So I have to get myself in order. Put the desires of the Father in me. So that I can begin to do the things that needs to be done. Yes, Lord. The more our DNA is changed, the more desire is in line with the culture of heaven. We don't do jobs in church to prove we ain't servants. We are servants uh, um, herded to leadership. Yeah? I, I want to try and get something across to you. We don't do jobs in church to prove that we are servant-hearted to leadership. Hello. We should have a role to line with our calling, not sit in an uh, ecclesia to prove our, our faithfulness, what we are. You know, I say this is so important. You know, my, one of my mentors, Ian Clayton, it says he, his desire for so many years as a businessman was to become a full-time pastor in his church. And I could see that because, I mean, I was, I was like that all my life. We belonged to churches with the, with the mother church. And I would just look at, at sons that would be in Bible school that would be around the, the pastor and the ministers. And they would just go become a cell leader, become an assistant cell or be assistant cell leader, become a cell leader, become a regional cell leader, become a, uh, you know, just grow and be, eventually become the pastor of the church, you know. And they could pay really well. And I'm talking about South Africa. I'm thinking, this is what I want. Because I always just wanted to become a pastor. And the day I became a pastor, I was like, oh, I don't want to be a pastor. This is ridiculous. This is disgusting. I hate it. <laughs> I'm like, really, uh, Lord, all I ever want to do is preach. I don't want to actually pastor anybody. There's nothing motherly about me. <laughs> no. I mean, I try to be as motherly as I can. But apparently it doesn't work all that well. <laughs> you know, I remember this one specific time, and I probably told the story a million times, but it worked out pretty good. I remember looking at my child while he's busy drowning in the pool, and I'm slowly walking over there, and I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> and I already have like five women that's ready to commit suicide jumping after this child. But my, 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 my idea behind it was to see him struggle and then help him, and then let go of him, so he can get out there by himself. So I saw him struggle and kind of drowning, so I'm like, oh, so I took my shoes off, I did forget to take my watch off, and that was the end of my watch, I was not impressed with this boy. How dare you drown? What is wrong with you, son? But I remember jumping in the water, and I just took him out and said, hey, you okay? He just looked at me, and I said, now keep going. I mean, that's what the father does. Then I, the, the second child, my, my ex-wife, she was like, hey, he's going for swimming lessons. And he went for swimming lessons. But I'm like, no, he will learn how to swim. I was watching this movie the other day. You know, and he takes a child, he throws him in the water, and he just says, kick the water as hard as you can. And the mother comes, she's like, what are you doing? He can't swim. I'm like, well, you go fetch him. And she's like, no, I can't swim. And he's like, excuse me? Because the father just wants to put you in a position where you have to do what needs to be done. Yes. The mother don't do that. Sure. No, please don't misunderstand me. All mothers are not like that, but a mother has a certain way of mothering a child, and a father has a certain way of fathering a child. Yeah. Yeah. And when we put pastors in charge in a church, and pastoring is maternal. It's, it's no one's fault. You might say, how dare you be maternal when you're a pastor? No, that's the function of a pastor. It's maternal. It's evangelist. The evangelist is the sperm. Don't look at me with that tone. <laughs> right? The pastor is the mother. The teacher is a little bit of life. Just kind of tells you where to go. Puts a little bit of desire in you and, and you kind of have a better idea of what you want to eventually do. But then you have to get to the place where someone tells you exactly what you need to do. Then you have to get to a place where someone sent you to go do that. Right. You know, that's kind of where we're missing some things in the church. Mm -hmm. Yahweh is calling a company of people that will be in the position where we are ready to go do what needs to be done. Exactly. Because the mother just wants to gather. Right. Mm -hmm. Wants everything perfect. Wants you to be ready before you go out. <laughs> you know, I love the way the eagles do it. Because the eagle will just kick the baby out of the nest. 
and wait. You better fly, boy. I don't know if I'm fast enough to get to you because you're falling. You're falling. You know, but he waits. He waits up to a certain point and then he realizes if I don't go now, he's going to die. Then if the bird doesn't fly, he will fly underneath him and catch him and bring him back to the nest. That's kind of a motherly, fatherly thing to do. You understand, birds, most of the time, they have to do both. They have to be both. And some parents today, we have to do both. I have to be a mother and a father right now to my children. I am a better mother than what I am a father. I know that doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> Are you guys okay? Yeah. I'm trying to get something across. I hope you guys are getting it. There's a strong chance if desire, if desire is not strong, you will not keep going in the task you will burn. You will eventually burn out. And I've been doing this for 10 years. Mm. That means on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Thursday, on a Friday, on a Sunday, for the last 10 years, I get in my vehicle and drive to a spirit school wow. and teach this to somebody. Not once did I try and do it in my own strength. Not once within what I desire, outside of what I desire. This is a desire of mine. I desire to see the body of Christ understand something that's clicked in my brain. It's like, like a click. I can't, even, I can't even explain it. Something clicked in my brain. Yeah. And my father wants us to understand what it means to worship, what it means to be one, what it means to be divided, what it means to go into the kingdom of heaven, what it means to be in another dimensional realm, what it means to love on him and worship him outside of religion. Outside. Because religion tells you you're a Christian. Just like another religion tells someone else he's a Muslim. Tells another someone else that he is a Jew. That's what religion does, tells you what you are. But my God's different because he comes and tells me who I am. And, and every religion has a do-do list. Sure do. Even though Christians believe we don't have a do-do list, everything is out of a do-do list. Right. Mm. Are you doing this, this, and this? Because if you're not doing this, this, and this, God's not going to come and bless you. Right. Wow. Hmm. See, we, are, we, we have to understand that he's the perfect father. Okay, because if uh, I ask, my son asks me for an egg, I'm not going to give him a snake. Right? Even though, although I'm an evil father. So you have to understand something. Uh, God is not an evil father. He's the perfect father. He wants what's best for you. He's not going to command you all the time. He's not going to shout and scream at you all the time. He's not going to tell you how bad you are all the time. He's not going to try and come against you all the time. The Father's desire is to get you to where you need to be. And He'll do everything in His power to get you there. Yes. When He wants you to get fully restored, He's going to have to open some gateways, open some doorways. He's going to shift your thinking. You have to repent. You can't believe the things you used to believe. Because the law first mentioned can bind you can stop you from going forward into what you didn't understand previously. Yeah. I'm trying not to lose you guys. Nope. Intimacy and knowing our authority as kings, chancellors, fuels desire. Yeah. And I'm saying this because you have to understand your responsibilities. Right. You know, we've been taught that your responsibility is to pray after you get up in the morning. Read your Bible. Go to work, come back home, spend time with your family. Before you go to bed, read your Bible, pray. Go to church on Wednesday, go to church on Sunday, and that's your duty. It sounds great, but we have to get to the point where we understand that's not what Yahweh wants. Exactly. My iron sharpens iron, and being around people that love Him is very important, and have the same mindset and believe the same as you. But I have to understand something. If what the Father is growing in me, it's not seen around me, then I have to move on. Ooh. And people don't like that. You know, I never moved out of the church I was born into because I never had to. They sent me at the right time. They sent me because I was ready to be sent. Once I got sent out of the house to go plant churches and to go be a minister, I grew from there. 
Once I became an apostle, where my, my father, my spiritual father came to me and said, Son, please understand, you are not a pastor. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Thank you, because I was about to kill this guy. <laughs> you know, when someone sits in front of you, and it's only about the 900th to 99th time that he comes and tells you the exact same story that he's done every week for the last 365 days, you like, he comes in front of my, the last time he came into my office, one specific young man, and I said to him, don't even tell me what you did. Let me tell you what you did. <laughs> so I tell him exactly what he did, and he's like, yeah. I'm like, don't come to my office again. Yeah. Because if you come sit in my office again, and you tell me that story again, I'm going to knock your teeth out of your mouth, boy. Do you understand me? My seven foot. And he was bigger than me, and I don't know if I would have been able to do that. But that's, that, that, that was annoying to me. I say, you do all that? I can't even think of doing that, and I get, I get rations from the Father. Who do you think you are? Anyway, I find out very early in my pastoral career that I'm not pastoral. But luckily, my, pa my father was there to come and tell me this. Once he shifted me from the pastoral to the apostolic, I began to shift because I realized how important it is to disciple. And that's when the desire of the Father, the desire that He's placed in our hearts begin to kick in. Yeah. That's why the order of your growth has to be so right and so perfect. Now, I don't know why there was never a teaching of the body, soul, and spirit in the body of Christ up until 10 years ago. And I'm saying it wasn't there, although I believe it was. We just never understood it and wanted to go full-time into it because we're afraid of everything. Wow. You know, and you're always just calling the people that understand what it means to not be afraid. Because if the perfect love cast out fear, and you're full of fear, then maybe you just don't know His love. Wow. Ooh. But if you don't know His love, and you're afraid of everything, then you need to, you need to meet my Jesus. Right. Because He's not, he's not what they said He was. Right. He's not this mean guy that don't like gays. <laughs> yeah. and it's funny, because He was best friends with these guys. Sure he was sitting in the pubs with him. The religious crowd was saying, oh, you're that, that guy, that, 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 that rabbi that sits in the bars and, and drinks with the sinners. <laughs> Look at me with that tongue. That's, that's what the Bible tells us. He did. Now, did he get drunk? No. Obviously not. It's self-control. Did he tell everybody about Jesus? No, he didn't. He was just there. Mm. It seems it's, it's calling at people that understand what it means to be in a position where the glory of the Father oozes out of you. Yeah. Because there's a, a, a place where you're talking about Bible, 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 and Jesus, 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 it's just not appropriate. Hello. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Oh, well, I might want to go there because no one's going to want to listen to me. Well, if you're only going to go if people want to listen to you, then what's the point? Well, if I go to a place and nobody wants to listen to me, but I know I need to be in that place, then I, maybe I need to change the way I speak. Jesus, hallelujah, karashata, kosamata. It's not going to work in a nightclub. No, no not the language. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'll get looks. They go crazy. Mm -hmm. And unless lightning strikes or uh, the fire of Yahweh burns in you, that's about all you're going to get that night. And if you listen to any of these crazy miracles that's taken place, it was never because someone stood there preaching Jesus. Matter of fact, Nancy Cohen talks about a time when she was standing in a nightclub. I didn't know this, but it was a satanic den. And she was standing in the middle of the dance floor just crying, sobbing for the lives of these people after Yahweh asked her to go in. And she sat there and she just cried. Two years later, a lady that was in that meeting came running to her said this she said i was in that nightclub when you were glowing like the sun on the dance floor and everybody got born again after you left Whoa. Wow. we have to understand something we just want to talk 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 it's who you are it's not what you say there's too much error in our speech too much I'm very talented. I've had Peter walk on water. 
several times. Not, I see Peter. Peter does walk on water. I mean Paul. I had Paul walk on water. And I have spoken on Moses 17 verse 19. Which is not in the Bible, by the way. Don't look at me like that. I've made lots of mistakes in my teaching, in my preaching, because you're talking and you're, you're focused on one thing, you're saying this, and there's nine other things that you're seeing in the Spirit, and you want to say this, but this comes out, and then you're still wrapped up in a way of thinking. You're still wrapped up in some worldly system, something that was taught to you by another teacher, that was taught to you by another teacher, that was taught by another teacher, and you have a perception of, of something you see the Father is showing you, and you're sharing it in the view that you have, but it's not quite the view that He wants to give you, because your perception is wrong, so you have to read established a truth so the first time I say one thing it might not even come out right second time I say something it might sound a little bit better but it might still not be a truth to you the third time I say it I've taken it all together I've broken all the small portions up and I get the purity of a truth and I say it right only now it's going to make sense but if you don't come back for those other two times you're going to think to yourself that guy's nuts Everyone's got error. But we have to be in a position in our lives where we're not afraid. And when I have the desire of the Father in me, I'm not afraid of nobody. No one. You know, today's society is a bunch of scary cats. I'm sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in a bar one night. And there's a bunch of, I don't know, I don't know if it's a gay club. I can't, I'm not even sure. But everybody around me seems to have been gay. <laughs> or not very straight. Or not male, but yet male. Or not very female, but yet female. Yeah. But they were strange. And they're talking about this guy that comes in and does this, and he's like, and I want to kick you down. I want to fight you. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't think you can fight. <laughs> and I don't think you would have kicked anybody's ass. As a matter of fact, I think you would have got your own ass whooped so badly, little man, it wouldn't even have been funny. Because your testosterone level is probably so very low that you're standing like this and you're talking like a girl. Okay. That's today's society. There's no real men today. I mean, let me tell you something. When, when you stand in a nightclub and there's a man comes walking up to you, you go... <laughs> and I look at him a little bit closer and I'm like, is that hot pants? <laughs> Are you wearing a freaking G-string? <laughs> but then I'm like... Is that a boot tube? You know, that's the thing the woman wears with no straps on it, just covers the breasts. I said, what is wrong with you? Who let you out the house like that, man? Lack of testosterone. Because you know what? If you eat certain foods, this is what happens. Men go and when they eat bad, bad food and you get overweight, your testosterone kind of fades out and your estrogen builds up. Yeah, women are the opposite. An overweight woman will have more testosterone and less estrogen. Mm. So you look at the food that our kids are eating and the rubbish and trash that's coming into the systems, that is freaky because their hormone levels are not at the right level. Mm. I'm standing on the top of the gym and I'm looking out on the pool and there's this, this young man comes walking out the pool. And I'm like, excuse me, is that woman swimming topless? And I'm like, oh, oh, damn, that's a 12-year-old boy that looked like a female because of all the estrogen in his body. Wow. And then we're wondering why we are dying. We are a company of people that Yahweh has placed the desires of his heart in, that has the capacity to change creation. That has the capacity to stand up for a generation to show them who they are supposed to be. A, a generation that's not being fathered by any father. Let me understand, they say more than 3%, less than 3% is fathered. Which means you can even have a father, but not be fathered. Thank you. You can be in a full forced family where the father is just not active, be involved right. in anyone's lives. That's what's going on. Then, of course, your average household in America doesn't even have a father. Yeah. 
I have a friend that has four kids. I have four kids. Except the problem that I have with him is he's got four dads, four moms. He's not fathering all four his kids. That's just one example. Because we have this mentality. Are you guys okay? I'm, I'm going on a rampage, but I'm really trying to get something across. When you have the right desires in you, and, and it's not just an order, and you don't just do things because, well, this is how it should be. You know, I, I go to my school, and uh, my, my kid's school, and in California, my oldest son has diabetes 1. He could self-administrate. In Louisiana, he can't self-administrate. Matter of fact, they don't even accept medication that comes from California. So now I have to go to a doctor here in Louisiana so he can get medication to take to school because the school doesn't take um, uh, medication from any other state. I'm like, but this is the same country. What are you even talking about? And I, say, I try to explain to them, well, I'm, I'm raising a, a man, not a baby. I'm trying to make sure that he can do his own thing when I'm not there. So this child that's 17 years old, is actually what you call a grown-ass man, can do anything and everything for himself. He can cook whatever he wants to eat. He can clean his clothes. He can brush his teeth. He can do his hair. He can put his own clothes on. He can do everything for himself. I can leave him alone in that house for weeks at an end, and he will be fine. I don't do that. I want to sometimes, but I don't. But I can, because I know he's fully functional. Because he's grown, I've raised him, but the school system doesn't want that. They want to keep you a baby. And I know this because two men are fighting, two 17-year-olds, and an older lady, a teacher, comes in and thinks that she can stop the fight. Mm -hmm. Gets punched in the face, and now she's suing the kids. Wow. Now, first of all, are you stupid? <laughs> Must be. What type of grandmother is going to stop two grown men from fighting? I don't know. <laughs> you guys understand what I'm trying to say? The whole system is motherly. Yeah, it is. But the desire of the father is not because it's fatherly. Mm -hmm. It's funny, there's no mother in the Godhead. Right. Well, you know, if you theologically want to discuss this, there could be a mother. But there isn't. Because you only need a mother for a very small period in your life. No, no, mom, moms, don't misunderstand. You know your value. Your value doesn't go away because you're just there for the baby and you just have to change his diaper. No, mothering is a very key thing. But you can't mother your children all your life. You want to, but that's how we do it. We want to protect. It's the, it's the mother's desire. The father is in there, but the mother just wants to protect and keep it safe. The father wants to get it out. Get it away. Get it ready. Get it sent off. Get it done, you know. Get out of here, man. I need some time with my damn wife. You want to go on a holiday without hearing dad, 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 nine million times. <laughs> you know, grow up. Get out of my house. <laughs> How old are you now? 17. Ah. Did I say that? Uh, <laughs> I know it's not like that, but it's, it's, it's almost like society has stopped us from understanding how important it is to kick yeah. <laughs> the eagle out of the nest. Yeah. You know, can't stay there forever. Nope. But when your desires are right, and you're shifting into the positions that the Father creates for you, then it opens you up and it changes you to go deeper, higher, wider. Yes. You know, and it's so very important for us to understand that Yahweh wants this generation of forerunners to have his desires, mm -hmm. to understand that there's, there's a dimensional realm through his word that's opened up for us to go into, to take what is ours and to run with it. It's his passion for us. It's his desire. For us to really truly grow in the revelation of what it means to carry his value in our hearts. And not to just be led by everything he says. And I know it's something we want to do, but Moses said, no God. You can't destroy this nation because you said you're going to take this nation and you're going to lead with this nation. It doesn't matter whether they're worshipping a golden calf. You can't go back on your word. So repent. You know whether Elijah... Elisha, no, it was Ezekiel, right? Yes. Go lie in front of the church for a year on your side naked. Mm -hmm. And only eat food cooked with human dung. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Just...
Can I not cook with human dung, please? Have a relationship. And I say that because he desires you to argue with him a little bit. Well, how dare I argue with God? It's your father. Exactly. But I've never seen him as my father. Well, it's time. It's time for you to see him as your father. Now, if you've disrespected your father over the years, don't go in there with disrespect, young man. Now, understand who is this father. He is God. But he loves you and only wants the best for you. I mean, he puts his desires in you. He wants to grow you. He doesn't want you to be religious. Oh, well, you know, I want to go to church Sunday. I haven't prayed at all this week. I haven't read my Bible. I'm going to see it. You are the body. He is the head. There's no separation. You might feel separated because you don't spend time with him. But when you do, it changes who you are. It, it, it enhances your DNA. It shifts you. It propels you. It grows you. You know, I, I'm closing with this. Over the last four years, my intimacy with Yahweh has grown to such an incredible place that I'm blown away at how close we are, how much I trust Him, how much I believe He'll always be there, how much I know that when He says something, it's going to happen. I just need to be patient. You know, He has shown me His faithfulness, and that covenant growth in our relationship was over the four-year period of me trying to get over a divorce that I had never wanted or even thought possible. And I, all I was doing with God in those three or four years was fighting with Him. That was the, the sole idea behind our relationship was fights. I'll listen a little bit and he'll pour some things and I'll be like, okay, yeah, but you know, you said this and this and this and this is not quite what happened. I, I, I can't even tell you how many times I fought with God and still do. It's not the whole idea behind our relationship, but that's what grew me close to him. To know that no matter how I feel, he's okay with it. No matter what I say to him, he's okay. I can't hurt God. Can't take glory from him. Can't surprise him. Say something he doesn't appreciate. Or say something that, oh, I can't believe you said that. Where did that come from? No, he knows everything. He's like this incredible, phenomenal friend that you can't lie to. You don't have to lie to. You can just be honest and tell him everything. And he'll always propel you and bless you and increase you. He never takes from you. It's like he doesn't need to take from you. And when you give him something, he always multiplies it back to you. Thank you. You guys okay? Father, well, we want to come before the throne right now in the name of Yeshua. And I know there was a lot of points, a lot of jumping around from one point to another. But I also ask, Father, that in our hearts we'll understand how important it is to move to living out a desire versus being led uh, every by every step. Let's understand that you're really looking for a company of people that as forerunners has your desire in their hearts. Runs after the things that we crave. I crave to be with you. Therefore, I, I can be with you because I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places. I step into the yad hey vav hey so I can live and move and have my being in you. It's a place of resonance. Father, I ask we'll begin to understand what that frequency of your beauty and your power brings to us. Let's begin to understand the value of being sons of the Most High God. Where you are our Father. We have your DNA. We are in your likeness and in your full measure. I ask tonight, Father, that you will take the hearts of your people in this room and shift us to a deeper place. Let's understand our relationship uh, above religion. Let's understand the covenant that you want with us is intimacy, relationship, not religion. It's not based on some order and five steps and nine keys. It is a relationship of love. How are you, my son? How are you, my daughter? How was your day? Come walk with me in the garden. Come eat with me at the table. Come sit with me while your enemies try to bring destruction to you, but they can't. Come look in my eyes. Come walk with me in the heavens. Let me show you the cosmos. Let me take you to the edge of creation. Let me reveal to you the signs and wonders and miracles that you'll do. Let me show you the currency that belongs to you. Let me take you into the rooms within my kingdom. Let me take you into the golden mountain. Let me show you Eden in every area of it. Let me take you on a journey, my child, because you have separated yourself from me. But now, because of my son that has died on the cross for 
for you, you get to come back and I restore you and I increase you and I bless you and I propel you and I excel you and I take you to a place where you've never been, although you've been there before. But in the restoration for right now, I want to take you on a journey to get to know me and love on me so I can show you the power that you come with and the full measure of my glory that's set on your life. Father, that's what we long for. That's the desire of our heart, is to walk with you, to act with you, to, to know you, to walk in your laws, to be set in your, your ways, Father, to understand all of who you are and to engage everything you open up to us. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, my King, in the name of Yeshua. Amen.